I had studied in Israel for a semester when I was in college, and one day I was walking down the street in Jerusalem, and I heard somebody yell, David. Well, how many Davids are there in Jerusalem? I didn't even turn my head. But I heard someone yelling again and again, David, David, and the voice was getting closer and closer. So I turned around, and it was a girl from my hometown who lived two doors down the street from me growing up, who had gone to a different college. I had no idea that she was in Israel, but there we were. When we have experiences like this, when things that seem unconnected suddenly connect, uh, we often say it's a small world. And it is a small world. You've probably had very similar experiences. Uh, you may have also heard about uh, the theory of six degrees of separation, that uh, there are no six, no more than six on average uh, con social connections between any two people in the world. The social connection is like a friend or a relative, uh, someone that you know, uh, a friend of a friend of a friend or a relative of a friend of a person that lived up the street from you that you knew, something like that, that, that no more, this, this theory has been around that no more than six social connections separate any two people in the world on average since 1929. Uh, it's, it's a significant theory. There, there's been a play was uh, uh, built around it. There was another spinoff that somehow found Kevin Bacon to be related to everybody in the world. I don't know, but, but uh, it, it's a small world. It's also a very big, big world. It's, uh, the world is almost 25,000 miles around uh, the middle. That's a pretty big waistline and has nothing to do with the coronavirus. Uh, it's also about 8,000 miles from one side to the other, going through the core. And it has a population of almost 8 billion people. That's a huge, huge world. How can something be small and big at the same time? And today we're going to talk about how the church is small and big at the same time, without even breaking a sweat. Hello, my name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, the Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these video streams of Living Water to give uh, a sense of connection and an opportunity to hear some reflection on uh, the state of living as a Christian in the L.A. County area and beyond, uh, or as a person who's looking for a Christian community uh, during this pandemic time. Uh, we do uh, a... Uh, uh, blog, also based on the text, the theme text of, of these uh, videos, and then uh, re-record them as podcasts, and I'll put all the links to all three of those. You can download the podcast, listen to them on uh, whenever you feel like it. You don't have to be looking at a screen while you're driving, um, or you can read it if you want in, in the blog. I'll, I'll put the, the, uh, the links in the comment section below. This is our 99th video. Um, so 100 would uh, seem to be a pretty big milestone, but we're making our milestone 104, because that would mean at twice a week, about a year's worth of videos. Uh, and then we're going to be doing something uh, a little bit different. We'll talk about more as, as that, uh, that goes on. So uh, the coronavirus is continuing to uh, be in retreat in most places in the country, although there is some concern that with uh, spring break and some other uh, uh, neglectful behaviors by some people in our country, that there are spikes some places and variants that are a little bit of a cause for concern in some places. But overall, it, things are opening up uh, with some restrictions. Uh, schools, businesses, restaurants, churches, uh, places that have been closed are now being, being able to open for indoor activities at, at uh, a lower rate of uh, capacity uh, to improve uh, uh, and, and make possible social distancing, uh, but still opening up. And that, that's a very good sign. There are still people who are ignoring everything and, and preventing things from opening up as quickly as they could, but, but we are starting to see some progress. Disneyland here will be opening up April 30th, uh, only with a 15% uh, capacity, but still that's, uh, that's uh, that's good. And that could change uh, based on whether uh, cases of the coronavirus are in increasing or decreasing. But still, that's the target and uh, it seems at this point to be very reasonable. Whatever the number of people, however, that are in the park, can pretty much guarantee, and I think I'm on pretty safe ground here, that there will be some parents 
being dragged by hyperventilating toddlers over to a ride called It's a Small World. It's a small world, if you've never been on it, is a water ride. You sit in a boat and you, uh, you are uh, pushed uh, by uh, scenes of uh, similarly featured people with different skin colors and kind of pastel national uh, costumes from around the world singing a song, uh, It's a Small World, Small, Small World, uh, about how we're basically all the same. And it's fun uh, the first time you go on it or the first time you hear the song. But once you've heard it and, and you hear it again and again and again or go on it again and again and again, it, it gets to be a little crazy, maybe. Uh, but that's the idea is, is to, I guess, to get it into your head that, uh, well, we're all basically the same. Uh, you may have seen the words in your rearview mirror on your car caution objects and mirror, mirror may be closer than they appear. And maybe that's the message of it's a small world. It doesn't appear so, but we're actually all basically the same. Uh, humanity is, however, at the same time, although we have a great deal of a great many things in common, incredibly diverse. And I think that that's part of our strength uh, as, uh, as the human race. Uh, we, as a Christian church, however, though composed of the full range of all human diversity throughout the world, are also one. And we are basically the same in our human nature. We are sinners, separated from God by our sin and in need of a savior. And we have opened our hearts in the Christian church to receive the savior, the work of that savior in Jesus Christ. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, the third chapter starting at the 29th verse, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, male or female. All of you are one in Christ. Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. We're connected by family, by, by a common relationship with the one uh, God, and that makes us one in Jesus Christ. We are also very different. Each one of us has different gifts or, or a gift. Gifts may appear one at a time, uh, but we have at least one gift throughout our lives. These are spiritual gifts that we receive at our baptisms. They aren't given to us, but they're given through us for the benefit of the whole. We have individual gifts, but we are gifted in order to benefit the whole body of Christ. That's the metaphor. If you look at your insurance policy, it'll say you lose so much for the loss of a member. A member is a part of your body. Uh, that's the original term of membership. You can be a member of a team or a club or whatever. Uh, but the, the idea is that there's one body, that's a biblical uh, understanding, but there are many members, there are many parts. We are both large and small at the same time because we cannot be separate from the body. And yet the body is made up of all of us. We, uh, Christ is the head. The church is the body of Christ, large and small at the same time. Each part of the body, however large or small, has been given everything it needs in order to accomplish what God has called upon it to do in the world. Knowing what your gift or gifts may be uh, as a Christian is one of the most important things we can do in our Christian lives because that's our spiritual job description. That's what we have to contribute. It has nothing to do with our interests or our talents or our abilities. Spiritual gifts are given specifically to build up the body of Christ, each part functioning according to its gifts. Paul writes in his first uh, letter to the Corinthians, the uh, uh, 12th chapter, starting at the 27th verse, uh, and that's just before Galatians. He says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, the body and individually members, both at the same time. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then he goes on to talk about, that's the whole chapter on love. But he makes the point, and, he, and the point is made in several of his letters, that 
there are many gifts. He, here he just lifts a few of them and uh, lists a few of them. And, and there some are signs and wonders type gifts. Some are gifts that are just ordinary gifts. And we'll talk about that in another video. You can go back and check that one out at another time. But the point is that there are many gifts, even though we are one body in Jesus Christ. And each of us has been given, the, individually has been given the gift or gifts we need in order to accomplish the work God has given us. And each part of a church has been given the gifts it needs. Each church has been given the gifts it needs. Each level of organization and cooperation of churches has been given the gifts that it needs. Each denomination, the whole, all the way up to the whole body of Christ on earth, all baptized believers in Jesus Christ throughout the world have all the gifts that they need in order to accomplish the gifts that God has given them. We are the body of Christ and we are individually members of it. This is how the church, the body of Christ works. It is large and small at the same time. And nowhere is that expressed better, in my opinion, than in small groups. Churches can be lots of things to, to different people. Churches can be social clubs. They can be places where cliques form. They can be places where social service uh, work uh, comes. They can be places where you find your best friends in the world and, and think of your church as a family. They can be all kinds of things other than things that, that nourish people as Christians, that, that focus on the work of the Holy Spirit and using those gifts of the Holy Spirit to build one another up. They can be social service agencies that use religious language. They can be uh, places where you have a sense of belonging and presence where people need you that, that are built around uh, certain uh, traditions that, that no longer have any meaning to new people. And new people have a hard time breaking in because they don't know the traditions. Uh, but you feel totally uh, loved and, and valued there and yet have nothing to do with, with a Christian life. Small groups are in your face. Small groups are places where people will want to hear about what your life is like as a Christian, how you struggle with sharing your faith, how you struggle with, uh, with both wanting to be loved by your family and wanting them to come to a, a living, uh, saving relationship with Jesus Christ. They'd like to know about your doubts, about your questions about the Christian faith, how you struggle to maintain your faith throughout this pandemic, or how it has strengthened you throughout this pandemic. That's what, what small groups do if, if they're doing what they are designed to do. We are called as God's people. I just remembered I didn't put on my microphone. But usually you can hear me anyway. Where's the other end of this thing? There it is. All right. So, okay, here's, here's the mic. Here's, here's, uh, maybe this will be a little better. Maybe this, this won't. Uh, but I've been talking about spiritual gifts, and hopefully you've been able to, to catch uh, most of that through the mic that was on the stand here. You can't give away what you don't have. That, that's the reality of the Christian life. And, and I think that a part of the reason that the church has struggled uh, in recent times is that we've lost focus on what we have. Uh, we've, we've settled for a, a professional organization, or, or we've settled for being a place that uh, uh, has some acceptance within the, the larger community that tries not to rock the boat or, or be too intolerant of people who who uh, uh, would ask of us to, to accept everything that they believe as being equally valid to what we believe, that, that spirit of rel the relative nature of truth. We've kind of gone along with that, and as a result, we don't have anything to give away, in my opinion, in, in some quarters. But it's hard not to grow in a small group. A small group can, be, be, yes, be totally taken off track. It takes effort and resolve to keep a group focused and off the emotional needs of one or two people. That, that is a classic for how, how small groups get taken off uh, track, uh, that get involved in the drama that people want to create in order to make themselves the center of attention, uh, and, and focus on the creation and nourishing and sustenance of the Christian life. It can be instead what one uh, colleague called majoring in minors. We need to major in majors, in, in the big things, the things that only we can talk about and, and will talk about, that, that no one else is fostering, and that's a living relationship 
with the one true living God that then produces a desire to go out and do justice. And by justice, I mean what, what I think the Bible means by justice, and that is doing God's will. Successful groups get attached to one another. And then, if their hearts are in the right place, they say goodbye as they grow and split in, and form new groups. That's another crisis for, for many small groups. People get, get, they love one another. That's the nature of our Christian faith. But, but for small groups to, to really work, they have to be willing to die. They have to be willing to. And that's how classically they, they small groups uh, start with about eight people or so. They grow up to 16. They'll have a leader and an assistant leader. Then when they get to 16, they divide and split into eight again. And then the assistant takes over as a leader. Each group uh, uh, forms an assistant. And then they, that's how they continue to grow. That's how we continue to grow, how the church continues to grow. It's cell division. It, it's how living things grow. But if we want to just stay in one place that, and, and take the easy route, when that crisis comes, when it's time to say goodbye, to, to split into half, then, then we're just going to kind of stay stagnant in the world. And that is not what a small group is. A small group is dynamic. That's its function. And, and if we cease to be that, then, then we're no longer um, uh, living according to our function in the body of Christ. Small, I think, in the new normal will be the norm. Uh, it will be a place where people returning after lives of, uh, of isolation who are hungry for community will come and want to find a sense of Christian community. There'll be whole lots of places where people can find community, but there are only a handful of places where people can find Christian community, and, the, and by far the, the, the largest of that kind of group is a Christian church. What kind of church will we be in the new normal, or what I think of as at least a part of that new normal being the small normal? One of the contributions of these, of these kind of groups is that it provides leadership training. It identifies leaders and, and trains them and encourages them. Not leaders in the sense of community leaders, although that, that is a kind of a byproduct, but a, leaders in the sense of having the spiritual gift of leadership. That is a gift, and yet how many places do we offer for people to exercise that spiritual gift? Small groups are hard to maintain, and they require constant attention. They need people with the gift of leadership, and God will provide that gift and has provided it at every level of the Christian church as we grow. Where there is anonymity, as in a large church, there is no growth. Christianity is the relationship that expresses our common relationship with God. If it were about our actions and about how much good we do in the world, we'd always be wondering if we're doing enough good in order to measure up to, to please God. Instead, the message of salvation is that God is pleased in Jesus Christ the gift of the cross. Our first focus is on that gift, and that gift is what then produces the Christian life. In uh, the Gospel of St. John, the seventh chapter, uh, starting with the seventh verse, uh, we hear this. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart, shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit which believers in him were to receive. For as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Not yet glorified. We are now on the other side of that glorification. The glorification of the cross, the resurrection, the ascension into heaven. We are on this side of the day when Jesus comes in his glory to judge the living and the dead. We're between glory and glory. We live in a relationship that's the other side of our baptism into the death of Christ and this side of our resurrection like his that that baptism means. This is not a passive connection. Christians live life as a new creation, a renewal given by the creator. That life is formed and fed and sometimes pushed by the Holy Spirit. Our life is life itself in Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. We live in this tension, this paradox, and, and this kind of faith that is a dynamic, but not a, ever a static relationship. We are never alone. We live in a state of being that is especially suitable for small groups. We are both large and small as the one body of Christ with many members. 
We cannot be a Christian by ourselves. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That, because it's an expression of relationship. Our connection as Christ, as Christians, is a matter of relationship that is built in a response to the relationship that we have with the one true living God. That relationship is what connects us. We, our congregations may be large or they may be small, but the fundamental building block of the body of Christ is small. We can easily maintain social relationships in our churches that just use religious language. Small groups, if we let them, can be places where instead we learn and grow as Christians, sometimes painfully, and see new Christians being formed, not by social connections, but by the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives where we too find ourselves transformed and truly connected. There is no six degrees of separation between Christians. There are zero degrees of separation among all those who are one in Christ throughout the world, connected by the living water of God, where we find ourselves connected with every other Christian on the planet in our common relationship with the one true living God. That connection is what makes it a truly small world. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have drawn us into the body of Christ, that you have provided the means by which, through which we were baptized and made into your people, that you have opened our hearts and given us the gift of faith. We pray that many might receive that gift, might open their hearts and know your presence. We pray that we might be members of the body of Christ at our local church, that we might be faithful in contributing and making a difference in the lives of all those within and outside of the church. For all those caring for those with the coronavirus, for those who now have it, and those in danger of getting it. We pray for all those awaiting a vaccine, for those struggling with the storms throughout our country, and for those who are financially struggling. We pray for those who provide essential services and those who seek the common good. We pray for those struggling for racial equality and for those who protect and serve. We pray for those who, derail, who seek to derail the efforts of people of goodwill, that their hearts may turn from destruction and toward the building up of all people. We pray for those struggling with all forms of violence, with mental health issues, and with substance abuse. We pray for the most vulnerable among us, for those who feel insecurities of any kind, and for the leaders of our government and of our church, and toward this end may we be your instruments in doing your will. We bring before you the requests that have been made known to us for Dean George Pindua and our brothers and sisters in Tanzania, for Candace, Jeff, Bill, Val, Ashley, Mike, Connie, and Troy for healing, for a family to manage stress, grief, personal struggles, financial struggles, conflicts, and other battles, and live according to your word and according to your will. For all those who are traveling, especially for Jeff and Donna and Keenan, for comfort and peace for the families of Manny Castro, Dan and Jana Crowther, Nancy Switzler and Susan Welch Livingstone, Samantha Henderson, Maria Paiva, and Rhoda Fink. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, even without our prayers, we bring before you in the words of the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we close, I'd like to uh, remind you, as always, to stay hydrated, to yeah, uh, keep enough water in your system, but also allow the streams of living water to, to nourish you, to, to form you, to sustain you. The, the, the Bible's metaphor for the Holy Spirit, to, to allow that spirit, and, and you know it's within you, allow it to, to move you and shape you in, in the way you live your life and, and talk about what, what it is, what it means to be a Christian. Remember your church, if you don't have one, uh, find one, Google one, look around your neighborhood, ask a friend or relative for recommendations, uh, call the pastor, uh, go online, uh, see what you, whatever you can do to find the, the church that you feel the Holy Spirit is most uh, likely calling you to be a part of, and, and then be a part of it, support it. If you're a member of a church, when you become a member of a church, contribute financially. 
pray for its pastor and church leaders. All of us are struggling in some way during this pandemic. Uh, make sure that it's there for you when we come back and we will come back to fully physically present worship once again. If you're having thoughts of suicide or struggling with mental health issues, contact a friend or relative, Google hotlines, uh, reach out to someone. It may seem like you're alone, but you are not. I guarantee that there are people around you who care about you and want, want to help you and want to help build you up and, and, uh, and, and help you through whatever circumstance you are in right now at, at this very moment. Uh, wear your masks, practice social distancing, uh, wash your hands or sanitize them as often as you can, get your vaccine, uh, don't go out unless you have to go out for uh, providing uh, essential services or receiving them, avoid crowds if possible, do whatever you can to, to keep this uh, curve going down and literally save lives and, and open up our economy once again. Finally, be kind to everyone you come into contact with. Everyone struggles in some way every day. Uh, be a person that is a helper, even though you may be struggling as well. Be a person that toward others seeks to make a better world for them. Finally, let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.